Right on. And may God bless our interns who are here in spite of having performances every night this week of The Little Prince and one more today. So thank you for being here. 2.30, it's 2.30 and you can probably still get tickets. And I've heard it's absolutely charming and wonderful. Uh, if you're joining us online, so sorry we're late, um, but we're here now. Welcome. So, uh, on your bulletin cover, I tried to make a quote that was more rememberable out of uh, some of the things from last Sunday's sermon. The other quote was kind of long and cumbersome. So this is just for you to try and internalize the kingdom of God is the redeeming activity of God in the world. So much easier to remember, right? It's the way life and society would be if a compassionate God were in charge. Here's what we know about the kingdom of God. Hold on here. I've got this fantastic line. The kingdom of God is among us to be lived out now. It is not pie in the sky by and by, something that's going to come later. The kingdom of God is to be lived out right now. So today, our passage is about the kingdom of God and healing. Because in scripture, these things are always paired together. So if we're going to understand the kingdom of God, we have to understand this pairing. Our scripture is from Luke chapter 9. And this is an event in the life of Jesus and his disciples that is in every, it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, Luke has just a little more meat on the story. So this is what happens. Jesus, and note, I want you to notice the kingdom of God and healing and how these are paired together. Then Jesus called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. He said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and, and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you, as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off from your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. And remember, the good news that Jesus preached was the good news that the kingdom of God is near. So that's the second pairing. Uh, this next section is what happens when the government hears about subversive healing activity. This is what happened. Now Herod the ruler heard about all that was taking place. He was perplexed because it was said by some that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead in the person of Jesus. But, and some said that Elijah had appeared and by others, that one of the ancient prophets had arisen. Herod said, well, John, I beheaded. But who is this about whom I am hearing such things? And he tried to see him. So on their return from this healing and preaching journey, the apostles told Jesus all that they had done. And he took them with him and withdrew privately to a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed all those who needed to be cured. The kingdom of God and healing. You know, when it's our association with the, the phrase, the good news. Because what happened after Jesus died and rose from the dead, when we read through the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament, we find the apostles both preaching resurrection and kingdom of God. But what happened over time is that the good news morphed into just resurrection. And so we came to understand the good news is the resurrection of Jesus. And we forget that the original good news preached by Jesus himself and the early church was 
the kingdom of God. Here and now, God's redeeming activity in the world right now, not just pie and the sky. So what is it about the kingdom of God and healing that together is so important and so powerful? Let me describe what it was like in the first century to you. There was this perfect cycle of victimization of the poor and disabled that happened. And it went like this. Heavy and excessive taxes, both from Rome and from the, the temple, which had taxes and offerings, right? Excessive taxation would leave poor people destitute, malnourished, disabled. But the, the climbers, right, the religious and political climbers were not going to blame the taxation for this. So they blamed the sick people themselves by claiming, and the poor, by claiming that their sickness and poverty uh, was because of their sins. And we see this in some of the stories about Jesus. So because they're sinful, they're sick and poor. And what that means is, what's the solution for that? It's the temple, because the temple is where you, uh, you know, make offerings for your sins and you make offerings for healing. So all of a sudden, you have this heavy taxation, you're poor, you're sick, you're blamed yourself, you have to go to the temple, and what? Pay more fees for forgiveness and prayers for healing? It was this perfect cycle of victimization of the poor and sick. So when Jesus, with a magical touch, cured people of their sicknesses and declared them forgiven of all their sins, he challenged this whole cycle. He was challenging the status quo of how everything worked. We have scholars that are saying this was subversive. Healing, the very act of healing in that culture was subversive because it started to bring health and wellness to people who were not going to find it anywhere else, who were just beaten down by the entire system. This is why it's so important that the kingdom of God and healing go together. The kingdom of God is about restoring people to this state of wellness, and it's about opposing the op oppressiveness that can happen within our culture towards the poor and the sick. You know, we have these cycles today. They look a little bit different, but when someone who is poor or disabled, let's say uh, they get a parking ticket because their plates had expired, well, their plates had probably expired because they had to choose between renewing their license and buying food for their family. So you're driving around with expired plates, and then you get a ticket. And now you have a fee to pay on top of not being able to even renew your license. And then what happens if you get another ticket? Or then your car is impounded. Then all of a sudden, you don't even have a car. And how are you supposed to get to work and even make money so that you can pay the fees for the money you never even had in the first place. You see how this cycle works? So Jesus was healing and forgiving and starting this uh, grassroots work among the communities. What we know is that there was an expectation that Jesus was going to be a messianic king and overthrow the government, kind of this top-down reign. But Jesus' reign as king was much more grassroots. Let's form communities of resistance. Let's change the way this whole cycle works. His, his ministry wasn't just uh, abstract spiritual teachings interspersed with phenomenal miracles. It was so much more than that. It was teachings about the kingdom and healings that paired together to build up this community that was going to take a stand against the oppression in the world. Healing today is, is more work 
than it was with Jesus. Sometimes we get these miracles, sometimes. But more often, healing is a commitment and an ongoing work that we do both for ourselves and for others in our community. One of my all-time favorite stories is one I want to tell you today. It's a story about healing. You may remember the story of, Anth wait, oh my gosh, now I'm going to forget his name, Anthony Lawrence. Uh, Anthony was a conservationist in Africa, and his conserve was called Thula Thula. Steve, you could probably tell this story as a South African. Um, but he worked with animals, and he passed away in, in 2012, but he wrote a number of books, among them the best-selling one, The Elephant Whisperer. But the story is told back, back uh, in the early 2000s, he got a call about this small elephant herd who were aggressive, they hated humans, they were renowned for, for breaking out of the preserve that they were in, and the leader of the tribe, a female matriarch, was just wily, like she could break out of anything, and the owners of that preserve just wanted to get rid of them, and so they called Anthony Lawrence as a last result and said, would you maybe take this herd? It was, it was 600 miles away, and they said, if you don't, they are going to be shot tomorrow. And he's like, I guess I'm in the elephant business. So they packed up the herd in crates, and they brought these elephants to Thula Thula, and when they arrived in this big, big crate, they were drumming. It's like you could hear the elephants, like, inside. They had to sedate them to bring them out and they had built a small enclosure within the larger, you know, miles and miles of game reserve at Thula Thula. They had a smaller enclosure, and when they came out, Anthony Lawrence tells the moment, they named the leader Nana. He remembers looking at Nana in the eyes because she was ready on the spot to trample him and escape. And he said, I just stood my ground and talked to her and said, this is your home now. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're going to take care of you. And he said there was a little glimmer when she stopped and turned and didn't barrel through the enclosure. But he said that night he couldn't sleep, and he looked out over the elephants, and they were all lined up, staring towards their former home. He said it was ominous. And then in the middle of the night, he got calls from his staff, and this is what happened. This, so there was an 8,000 volt electric fence around this preserve. This new herd had found the generator that powered the electric fence, and they had trampled it, and then they took two of the posts, I'm sorry, I'm like poofing into my mic, they found two of the posts uh, embedded in concrete into the ground, and with their trunks, they had band together and ripped the posts out of the ground and had escaped out into the wild. So it, it, was a, it was a race because here's what happened. Local poachers were waiting with rifles to kill these elephants. So it was a race once they were off Thula Thula to get them back into the preserve. So Anthony and his staff are racing out to try and herd the elephants back into their land. They also hear over the radio that the um, the, just the park guards were now getting their rifles out. So there's two groups ready, converging, ready to shoot the elephants. They're trying to get them back on the reserve. They get them back on the reserve. And here's what Anthony Lawrence realized. How am I going to convince these animals that they're safe and to stay? Because they had been traumatized in their life. The young male had seen his mother and sister shot before his very eyes and then was loaded into this cart and moved, right? They, there was trauma. And here's what Anthony said. Let me find the quote. In a flash came the answer. I would live with the herd. To save their lives, I would stay with them, feed them, 
talk to them, most importantly, be with them day and night. We had to get to know each other. And that's what he did. He got his bedroll, and he went out, and he slept with this angry herd that hated humans. And by his very presence, loved them into healing from their past trauma to the point where they were ready to be released and live and roam freely at Thula Thula. And here's the amazing thing. When Anthony Lawrence died in 2012, the, the elephants were two days away. No one told them he had died, but they traveled for two days when he died to his home. And they stood and circled around his home for two days to pay homage to the man who loved them. Do you know that they did this for years after? And this week, I tried to find out if they were still doing it, and I couldn't find any news articles on it. They could be very well doing it to this very day, that two-day journey to honor the man who loved them. Their healing took commitment, time, love, relationship. That's most often how healing happens now. My mom's brother, my Uncle Jack, was a charismatic Christian, very into the, the spirit and the gifts of the spirit, and he was a healer. And his daughter Beth, my cousin, inherited this gift for healing prayer. And at her church in Washington, they actually have a healing ministry with healing rooms where people can come and be prayed for. And I remember asking her once, like, Beth, how does, what happens? What happens in the healing rooms? And she said, Barb, it, it, we rarely see miracles. But what we do see is that people who come back every week for prayer, that their lives change and that healing comes. It's, it's a commitment to claiming the kingdom of God is about our wellness and that our wellness can impact the world around us and the wellness of others. I, I think about, you know, there's physical, literal physical things we need to be healed from, but then there's also things of trauma and stress that we need to be healed from. And you think about, you know, some of the statistics we know that people who are abusers were abused. A high percentage of people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol were abused as children. I, it's my person, I have no statistics for this one, but I think that people who start wars are deeply, deeply wounded people who what they really need is internal healing. And that's why the kingdom of God is so subversive because it starts at the point of our deepest need to be healed physically, to change the cycle, to be healed spiritually and emotionally and from our trauma. And that's how we change the world when we, we embrace the wellness. And here's what we know, that Jesus lived among us to do just that. We're the elephant tribe, friends. Jesus is Anthony Lawrence. What God of the universe would take a human form to actually live among the ones who need to be healed? It's exactly what Jesus did. He preached that the kingdom of God is near and he healed people. And here's what we know, is that the kingdom of God is the redeeming activity of God and the world. It is the way life and society would be if a compassionate God were in charge. And we, whenever we see hope and healing and transformative change, we can say, ah, oh, that's God's kingdom. It is here, and it is alive among us. Will you pray with me? 
Lord God, so many here today need your healing. There are some who walked in these doors today in deep need of your physical healing. And others, God, whose spirits are broken and they need your healing. So we look to you, God, to be near to us, to touch us, to look us in the eye, to help us with what we need today. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.